Hi folks, the longsword uh, seems to have become the archetypal medieval sword in people's minds. Um, whether they're talking about sort of um, uh, sort of medieval martial arts um, or comparing it with uh, other nationality or, or cultures swords like the katana or so on or in fact if you look at, at movies as well whether you're looking at pseudo historical movies like ironclad uh, or if you're looking at fantasy movies like lord of the rings the uh, <coughs> long sword seems to have become the go-to sword for the uh, medieval warrior and what i really want to say is that um, this was the knightly sword of a very specific period of um, of history in Europe um, and <clears throat> whilst, um, whilst it did appear earlier and did carry on later the real height of the long sword's favour uh, as represented in the fencing treatises that we have surviving uh, was really from uh, about 1360-1380 the long sword uh, sort of came to the fore and became the, the primary knightly sword um, right the way through to the end of the 15th century, so sort of 1490, 1500 kind of time, maybe 1510. Um, and so, you know, for about 150 years, this was uh, the knightly sword, I suppose. It was, the, it was the sword that was featured the most heavily in the fencing manuals of the time, and it, it, it's the sword that has become associated with the high nobility in this uh, period, in the late Middle Ages and the beginning of the Renaissance. <clears throat> but um, a couple of things I want to say about it really is that um, because it features heavily in those fencing treatises, um, it, um, it, people get the impression that it was you know, the only sword really used by the knightly classes at that time, which of course it wasn't. They, they also used the messer and the one-handed sword um, and falchion and, and other types of um, sword that were around at the time as well. But for whatever reason, and I'll talk about this probably in another video, it was fe fe uh, featured quite heavily in the fencing treatises. But if we think for a second, these were books which were written down uh, before the, most of them before the, the printing press, and then, uh, you know, sort of from the end of the 15th century onwards uh, with the printing press, and they were expensive things to buy, the, the actual books themselves, the manuscripts and then the, the printed books. Um, so they were printed for the nobility and for the, the real uh, top echelons of society, the people with lots of money and so-called knights. Um, uh, but what we need to recognise is that lots of other people in society used and carried swords and many of them did not carry long swords. Um, in, in Germany, the Messer was the sort of common uh, go-to go -to weapon for a lot, lot of, lots of sorts of people, lots of types of soldiers and civilians. Um, and, you know, in uh, France and Italy and England, uh, <coughs> actually the one-handed sword was always statistically more common than the long sword. Of course, it doesn't feature so heavily in the fencing treatises, because the fencing treatises were written for the knightly classes and therefore it focuses, they tend to focus on the longsword. Um, the one-handed sword, however, in terms of common soldiers and common people, was always more common, uh, a more uh, frequently found weapon than the longsword. Um, and even more than that, the uh, sort of sidearm set of the common people, certainly in, in England and France, uh, was the sword and buckler. Okay, A buckler is a small steel shield, sometimes they're wood, sometimes they're leather, sometimes they're a combination of those materials. But the sword and buckler was a much more common weapon set for common soldiers and common people. And if you look at the uh, records, English records for example, from the um, 13th, 14th and 15th century, you see the sword and buckler referred to a lot. Uh, whereas the, uh, the two-handed sword or the long sword is referred to relatively little um, in most records. Um, and not only that, but the sword and buckler is shown a lot in period artwork, um, at the, at the, worn at the side um, or carried by uh, common soldiers such as you know, longbowmen or what we would now call billmen, although they weren't called that at the time, um, and so on. So <coughs> sword and buckler actually 
was a much more common weapon set, even in the late medieval period, than longsword was. But the longsword gets all the glamour because it was the knightly sword, and therefore features in the knightly treatises which deal with knightly fighting. Okay, uh, so that's all I want to say really. Sword and buckler, um, maybe not as glamorous, maybe doesn't get as much exposure um, in, in most of the medieval treatises, but remember that the earliest medieval treatises, uh, I-33, shows sword and buckler, and uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the, what you could look at maybe the last medieval-ish treatise, uh, you could say was maybe Manchelino or Morozzo in the 1530s, and um, they're still dealing with the sword and buckler very heavily. So sword and buckler was actually an incredibly popular companion weapon set right the way through from the, you know, with the small buckler at least, from the sort of 12th century right the way through to the 16th century, and was only really supplanted when the rapier and dagger came along. Okay, thank you.